Now in chapter 13, the great subject is the breaking up of Lot and Abram. You know, we consider the question, was Abram right to bring his dead brother's son along with him? What did God mean when he said, leave your father's house? Did he mean just leave the place of your father's house? Or did he mean leave your father and your father's grandson? Well, I don't know. We ask the question about it. We give Abram the benefit of the doubt. He could not have felt good if he had deserted his aging father. He could not have felt good if he had deserted his orphaned grandson, his orphan nephew, his father's grandson. But the fact is, Lot became uh, trouble for him later. And as the young man grew, he had his own flocks and his own property. And God blessed the cattle and the flocks of Lot, even as he blessed the cattle of his more righteous uncle, Abram. We see that uh, Abram leaves Egypt in chapter 13. He goes to the Negev, that southwestern desert which borders uh, what is now Israel and Egypt. And it says that he was very rich, verse 2. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. And uh, he built an altar <clears throat> in the place where he went, and he began to call on the name of the Lord. You see, he's a worshiper. Verse 5 says that Lot also had flocks and herds and tents. And in the fullness of time, there began to be a conflict between those servants who were taking care of Abram's flock and those servants who were taking care of Lot's flock. And in verse 8, the wise and older and more righteous man says to his nephew, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right, or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Now, there are two important things to notice here. Uh, Abram has every right to claim um, that he should make the choice, that he should choose the place where his property would be and Lot would take the part which Abram did not choose. I just want to say here on a practical note, as a pastor, one of the most dangerous times in the life of a family is when an, the older generation begins to die and the property is divided. Let me just say that people who were apparently normal, people who were apparently sane, people who were even apparently spiritual seem to lose their minds at a time like that. They become so jealous and so grasping in trying to get what is theirs when, when there's a property settlement. Look at the example of Abraham. He gives the younger man, the, the man who has the less claim and the less right, probably everything Lot had by now he owed to Abram. And yet Abram lets him make the choice. Now there's another thing here. When Abram sees there's a problem, Abram, Abram initiates. He takes responsibility to be sure that there's a good relationship. He brings the problem up. He proposes a solution. Just before I got married, uh, a, a friend of mine who'd been married for four years, one of the godliest people I've ever known, he went on to be a missionary in New Guinea and translate uh, the Bible for a primitive tribe in Papua New Guinea. He said that the best advice he ever got before he got married was this, that in any relationship, where there's a problem or where there, there's a breach or a, a fight or a breakdown in goodwill, the more spiritual of the two initiates reconciliation, begins the conversation about how the problem can be um, addressed and how the problem can be dealt with. And the obvious example of this is our relationship with God. Who initiates reconciliation? God does. Who is right in the controversy and who is wrong? 
God is right and we are wrong, but God initiates reconciliation. And if you have a quarrel with a family member or with a friend or with your husband or wife, and you have a great sense that they are wrong and you are right, you are tempted to think, well, they're the ones who are wrong. They're the ones who should come to me and ask forgiveness. I'm not going to go to them. Whenever you think that, you're listening to the devil. You're not reading the Bible, and you're not learning from the Bible. There was a problem, and the more righteous person initiated reconciliation, and he makes reconciliation. And notice the trust of Abram. You know, what if this boy takes all the best land? Well, the blessing does not come from below in the earth beneath our, beneath our feet. The blessing comes from above, from heaven. The Scripture says that the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek are those who are not grabbing for what they can get by their own strength. The meek are waiting for God to give them what He wants them to have. That's the difference. It doesn't mean that they're weak. They could get it if they wanted to. But they're meek. They wait on the Lord. I have a friend who um, has actually visited me here in this country. And he's a very wealthy friend. He was the managing director of 24 companies. And he's one year younger than me. And he was a good friend. I don't see him much anymore. But one day I asked him, Jack, why are you so rich and I'm so poor? I, I didn't say it exactly like that, but I just wanted to know what his secret was, why he was so wealthy. And he said, you know, I'm really not that good at business. I'm really just good at one thing. And I said, what's that? He said, negotiation. And I said, well, what's the most important thing to know about negotiation? He said, the most important thing to know is you must always give the other person a choice. That he gets to make a choice. But that what he doesn't know is that either choice is okay with you. He said that's the key to being a great negotiator. Now, um, this person also told me this, and, and what he said sounds very obvious. It sounds like something I should have figured out by myself. But it's one of the greatest things that anybody ever taught me, and it's an important thing for all of us to know. He said, Ronnie, you don't want to ever own anything that God doesn't give you. If God doesn't give you something, don't try to get it. Don't try to get it yourself. Now, Abram understood this. Jacob did not. And we'll talk about that when we get to Jacob's generation. But Abram understands that. He lets the younger man make the choice. And the younger man, who is the more carnal man? You know, Christians debate over which categories we assign to believers. And what I mean by that is that there are some Christians who are very comfortable with the category of the carnal believer. And other Christians say there is no such thing as a carnal believer. You're either spiritual or you're fleshly. You're either born again or you're not. But most Christians in the West talk about the carnal believer, and we, we take this teaching from 1 Corinthians 2 and 3. And I want to say that Lot is a, an Old Testament picture of a carnal believer. We would be very, very tempted to believe that Lot was in hell if it were not for the New Testament. But we're actually taught in the New Testament that Lot was a righteous man. And I guess he was righteous compared to the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. But he doesn't seem very righteous compared to his uncle Abram. Because when he's given this choice, he looks around, verse 10. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the Emek Hayardin, the Valley of the Jordan. I lived in the Valley of the Jordan in the summer of 1976, my last summer as a single person. I worked on a kibbutz there. It's the most beautiful part of Israel, and it was probably much more beautiful then. We have some indications 
that the ancient Near East was much more lush and beautiful and bore much more, uh, many more trees and plants and vegetation over 2,000 years ago than it does now. Now much of it is a desert. Some people believe it has, that has to do with false religion. But the reality is the Emek Kayardin, the Valley of the Jordan, was the most beautiful part of the land. And Lot took it. He took the most beautiful part of the land for himself. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So verse 11 says, Genesis 13, 11, So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. And it says by the time you get to verse 12 that Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now here's another great principle. If we only consider physical advantage, then we often fall into spiritual danger. Lot chose the place that he believed would give him the greatest financial advantage. But that place was also the place which would bring him into the greatest spiritual danger. And there are disastrous consequences. The man who takes everything because of the will of his flesh in chapter 13 loses everything because of the judgment of God in chapter 19. And we'll see that pattern unfold. It says, it says in verse 12 that Abram settled in the land of, of Canaan. And, and as we all know, verse 13, the men of Sodom were, exceed, were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Now look at verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, Abram lost Lot. He lost his nephew. It says the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, he lost Lot, but he still had the Lord. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. God says to him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and west, westward. He tells him to walk over the land. He tells him that uh, he's going he's gonna to give him so many descendants that it will, be, it will be as hard to number his children as it is hard to number the grains of dust under our feet. Arise, verse 17, walk about the land the length and the breadth, for I will give it to you. As you, as many of you are, are young and you're still making critical decisions, and if you're a little bit older, you're helping younger people make critical decisions. What do we build our life on? Let me make a suggestion. Build your life on the I wills of God. Build your life on the I wills of Christ. When God says, I will do something, you count on it. And you design your life around those kinds of promises. God appears to Abram, or God speaks to Abram in 12, 1 and 3. Uh, he appears to him in 12, 7. And now for a third time, he speaks to him again, and he tells him to look around. And every time, he, he gives him a little bit more information. He fills in the blanks of the blessing. He tells him a little bit more about what he's going to do for him. And of course, the hard thing is waiting, believing and waiting, waiting and believing.